Hello everyone. Welcome to the Moodle Academy webinar on Moodle plugins directory review process. My name is Rajni Totaram, developer edu educator at Moodle Academy. And I'll be joined by my colleague Anna Krasa, who is also from Moodle Academy. She will help me facilitate today's session. Our speaker today is Dan Marsden, Community Development Manager at Catalyst IT. Uh, Catalyst IT is a premium Moodle partner. And Dan has been part of the Moodle community since 2004. Many of you may already know Dan or have benefited from his many contributions to Moodle. Uh, when you download a plugin for, from the Moodle plugins directory, chances are that the plugin was either re reviewed by Dan or David Matra. The Moodle plugins directory is an important platform for Moodle and Dan is a key person that ensures that the plugins that are in the plugins directory are of acceptable quality. And with those words, I'm very happy to welcome Dan Marston. Uh, over to you, Dan. Thanks, Raj Neil. It's great to meet you all and uh, and share today. Um, I'll just wait for Raj Neil to relinquish presenter, and hopefully, I'll get the right slide here sharing with you. I think that's showing the right slide now. So yeah, thanks, thanks for the introduction, Raj Neil. It's 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 a great privilege to speak with you all today about the Moodle plugins database. As Raj Neil mentioned, I work for the premium Moodle partner Catalyst IT. And I, my role as the Community Development Manager here at Catalyst includes engaging with the Moodle community around the various open source plugins we release. And I also volunteer to help maintain the plugins database, as I believe that a strong and well-maintained database is one way I can contribute back to the wider community. I really enjoy myself seeing the wide range of innovations from, from plugin developers who come up with crazy ways to extend and improve Moodle. Um, and so I, I really enjoy the opportunity to see some of that firsthand before the rest of the community does. Um, the review process provides a way to cultivate that collection of plugins that have been through some basic checks to ensure and maintain a level of consistency, trust and safety for the community. Uh, in this presentation, I'm going to go through a high-level overview of the plugins database itself with some statistics and the process of submitting and reviewing plugins to show how easy it is for other people to engage with that process. We'd really love to have more help from the community, so if anyone here is keen to, to jump on board and help testing or, or review plugins, reach out after the, the presentation. I'd love to chat and, and hear how you might be able to, to jump in. So. Why should plugins be listed in the plugins database? Uh, most of the people here should probably have some pretty good ideas already. Um, there are quite a wide range of benefits for plugin developers and the community to have something listed within the plugins database. It's kind of the go-to place for people looking for ways to extend their existing Moodle sites. But it also provides an easy way for administrators to install a plugin and know when an update to that plugin is available. Plugins in the database are also sent to Moodle's language translation tool called Amos, which allows the community of translators to translate the user-facing strings within the plugin. If the plugin's not in the database, then the developer has to maintain their own language packs and they, they can put them into the plugin code base, but they, they lose the, the flexibility of the wide community of translators who are quite eager to, eager to, to get their hands on and, um, and improve the translations of, of contributed plugins. The other thing is some institutions or companies or universities or polytechs have policies that say, we will only install plugins if they're listed in the plugins database. That also includes sometimes updates. So they won't install updates to your to, to the plugin unless that update's been pushed into the plugins database. So there's quite an important sort of central um, sort of service that Moodle provides for the community as in, in, in the plugins database. We have a group of people called the plugin guardians um, who are the, the our mission is to help build the plugins database in a sustainable way, but to help protect the community from plugins that might present a significant risk to their sites. Personally, one of the biggest reasons I work as a guardian is to serve the plugin developers themselves, providing them with feedback and suggestions on how to improve their code. This is actually one of the key reasons I enjoy working on Moodle itself, 
when I was first starting out as a software developer many years ago, I found Moodle at the time. Uh, it, it met the needs of the organization I was working for. And um, I started tinkering with it and submitted some patches. And it was the first opportunity I had as a developer to get real peer review on my code, allowing me to sharpen my skills as a developer. And, uh, and my role as a guardian helps me pay that forward. Um, it's something I'm quite passionate about. Um, to run, run through some, some basic stats. Uh, there are currently 2,257 plugins that have been approved in the plugins database, all with a wide range of, of different sort of functionalities that can extend to the site. That's supported by around 1,250 developers, which is pretty impressive as well. Um, uh, these, these are people that have contributed code that they've written for the organization or code that they've written in their spare room. Um, some of the, the plugins in the database that I've written have been in, sort of done as a crazy idea at night while my kids are in bed and I've thought hey I wonder if this will work and I've, I've knocked something out so there's quite a wide range of those developers that recent download figure kind of astounds me you know, and that's that's 477,000 downloads from the Moodle plugins database those are people taking the the package inside the database and installing it in their site. And that's just phenomenal, really. When you think about the number of Moodle sites around the world, the fact that they're being down, that the, the plugins themselves are being downloaded means that the number of users using those, those plugins must be just insane. Um, at the moment, uh, this is kind of uh, as of a couple of nights ago, I haven't checked today, we have 45 plugins uh, that are in the queue at the moment waiting for their very first review. Some of them been waiting quite a while, unfortunately, and some of those have come in just recently in the last couple of weeks. Um, there are also in that list on top of that 23 plugins that are waiting for a second review. So these are plugins that have previously been reviewed and have failed the review process and are coming back and saying, hey, I've fixed these problems. Can you take another look? Um, and on top of that, we also have eight, approximately 800 plugins that have been submitted to the plugins database and then rejected at some point, um, waiting for those developers to update the, the plugins. Sometimes the developers come back really quick uh, when we, we review a plugin. Uh, sometimes it's on the day. Uh, I've even had developers that I've been reviewing um, minute by minute and I post a, a, a tracker issue in their GitHub repository and they fix it within minutes before I finish the full review. So it, it ranges. Some people come back two years later and say, hey, I've finally got around to fixing this thing up. Can you take another look? Um, this is just uh, some basic stats that show sort of about how many new plugins we get submitted to the plugins database each week. Uh, it's kind of like the first 16 weeks of, of this year. Um, and you can see it kind of trends upwards. And we get approximately at least two new plugins a week, but sometimes we get up to nine or 10 in one week that are the submitted in a bunch um, that, that get added to the queue for, for review. Uh, in that period between January and April, uh, approximately 108 plugins were reviewed within that period. 54% of those were rejected when they first came in the door uh, and 46% were approved. Some of those approved ones may have um, had uh, some iterative sort of reviews. And if the developer has responded quickly, it may not have been fully rejected. It may be that they just updated the code really quick and we, we approved them pretty fast. Um, unfortunately, some of the reviews are taking a bit of time at the moment because we don't have a lot of the, the team and uh, volunteering for, for reviews. When is the review performed? Uh, so the review is only performed the first time a developer submits their plugin to the database. If it gets approved, then the review team don't see it again. Of course, there are Moodle partners and organizations that will provide some sort of level of uh, checking on plugins before they install them. So the beauty of open source is that there are lots of people looking at that code once it gets released. Um, but once they do get that plugin into the database, they're free to make any updates or changes as they wish. We don't we don't look at it again from the review team perspective. I'm just going to share some initial um, <laughs> plugins that we discover during the initial process. Um, some stories about plugins that we want to protect the wider community from. 
the first one, uh, you might recognize someone in that picture or, or, or not. Um, this particular issue occurs more than you would expect. A developer takes an existing plugin, renames it to something else, and then replaces all the statements that reference the original developer. So that's all of the copyright headers, all of the information in the readme file. It might have been written by Rajneel, and instead of putting Rajneel in all of those he in those statements, they've replaced that with their own name. Sometimes that's unintentional, and we're able to encourage the developer to to instead take a think about that, and instead if they have some some tweaks that they think would be useful to the community based on that plugin, maybe they could contribute them back to the original version of that plugin. If Rajneel was a developer, maybe they should send a pull request with that change. Um, if they're not willing to do that, we still allow plugins to come into the database that are copies, it's open source, but they need to retain the original copyright statements to their plugin. So it needs to say, this plugin was inspired by a plugin written by Rajneel, and it needs to have his copyright statements within that code. Um, we have occasionally had some external organizations that have not made any improvements to the plugin at all, and all they've done is rebrand it, uh, and they're, they're using it as, a, as an advertising platform for further services. And those are things we really want to protect the community from, but also um, the the safety and the reputation that you get from the Moodle.org plugins database. If we allowed a lot of this stuff to come in, the reputation of the plugins database would suffer. Another example, uh, this happens quite a bit, is untested plugins. Sometimes the plugin guardian team are the first people to test a plugin, other than the original developer. Common problems we find include plugins that completely break the Moodle site, or don't work on databases that Moodle supports, or maybe work on an old version of Moodle. This testing process is quite vital, particularly because it can be quite challenging for a Moodle administrator. If they install a plugin from the plugins database and all of a sudden their site dies and breaks and doesn't work anymore. The plugins database is quite nice in that it allows you to install plugins really easily. But if that installation breaks your site, the administrator often doesn't always have the skill set to understand how to restore access to that site, going to the to the server, removing the directory to allow the site to function again. Um, this is also something that pretty much anyone that, that is engaging with the plugins database can do. Um, so we'd love to help ha have help with testing. Another common thing we see at the moment is empty shelves. Uh, uh, sometimes it's a student testing and they've written some sort of test plugin and they want to know what is this plugins database about? And so they upload a zip file that doesn't actually have any content. Um, but occasionally we get plugins that, that add features to Moodle that already exist in Moodle as a feature that they haven't found. Um, good example of that might be a, an antivirus tool. Um, instead of finding inside the Moodle interface that there's the ability to set uh, clam up, they might create a plugin that does exactly the same thing because they haven't found that setting within the interface. And so the, the reviewer is able to say, hey, did you know this is already in Moodle? We don't actually need a plugin to do it. And if that plugin doesn't actually add any feature or value to the product or the, the plugins database, we tend to reject it at that point and say, it needs to have something uniquely um, uh, uh, useful in the plugin before we can approve it. We also get plugins that are just there for advertising um, to, to be able to use the plugins database as an advert for their commercial services. And so those are also things that we try to, to protect um, to maintain that reputation of the database. Anonymous login, this is one of my kids. Um, this happens occasionally too as well, where you get a plugin that, that integrates with an external service, but in that process, what they do is they write code that allows anyone in the world, even a baby, to log into your Moodle site as anyone. Um, and that can also be a risk to the external tool as well as Moodle. So you may end up being able to um, log into Zoom as an anonymous user and become a moderator in any room. Where you know you, there's, there's a range of things that we, we try and sort of protect in that space. Um, another one. 
<laughs> we occasionally see plugins that secretly pass information about your Moodle site to an external service, uh, an information leak. So that can include information on your users, version of the Moodle you're using, other related information. Uh, and when a plugin does this, it must clearly document what information is sent to that external service and make it clear to the administrators that it is doing this. It can't just secretly have some code that calls back to some home server and says, here's all the information about this Moodle site that is using this plugin. Um, I'm not sure if anyone recognizes what that's. I haven't looked at the, uh, the, the, the chat, but uh, that is a vegetable. Uh, the name of that vegetable is a leek. So you might understand where the uh, the reference there is. Um, so now I want to take you through what does it take to to register a plugin in the database? Because some of you would have seen that that we would have submitted things. Some of you won't have. Um, I won't take lots of time on this. But uh, when a, a developer has a plugin they want to upload to the plugins database, they log into the Moodle.org site visit the plugins database interface and on the right hand side there's a, a blocks section sometimes that's collapsed so you need to click on the wee link to expand it out and in that panel there there's a link to register a new plugin so they click on that register a new plugin link and then it opens the next part here that it's showing here and they can upload a zip file that's as simple as is is required for this first part of the interface um, we give them some extra information on that page ask them to uh, look at the plugin contribution checklist but quite often they don't do that they just upload the zip and they hit continue uh, then they get taken to a, a another page asking for further information such as a description of the plugin screenshots other related information Plugins must also have a public source control repository uh, with a publicly accessible issues tracker. Sometimes developers will put a website URL or a contact form link instead of their source control repository. When I say source control repository, that's something like GitHub, which, which many of you will be aware of, but it's not required to be GitHub. They can use anything like GitLab, Bitbucket, or some sort of internal source control repository that they use in their organization, as long as it's publicly accessible to, the, to other people. Um, you must also allow other people to create issues in that issues tracker. So sometimes people put it in their institutional Git repository, but don't allow the public to create accounts so that they can create issues in the tracker. So we, we have some communication with developers around that. Then they get this uh, this new page, basically well, after they've filled in that information that does some further validation checks. After a, 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 if, if a plugin has been flagged as requiring more work and the developer is ready for the review team to take another look, they click on the developer zone tab sort of underneath those red warning items there and they get another page that lets them hit a request reapproval button to add it back to the review queue. Um, so you can see on that um, on that validation page, the, the the page is asking them to fix some information about the description, the bug tracker URL, and and screenshots and stuff like that. But now I want to talk about the review process itself and some of the common issues we find through that process. The report shown here is available to all users visiting the plugins database. It's on that same expanding um, uh, block section to the right-hand side of the plugins database. It shows the full list of plugins that are in the database that are not currently approved. I find it best when I'm looking at this particular public page to sort by the status field. Um, so you can click on that wee status column up the top and it will sort everything and show um, uh, the, the ready for approval items at the top. As well as, it also displays some other information like the link to the source control repository that the users added and a link to our Moodle tracker approval issue. We do all of our sort of workflow processes via the Moodle tracker. It has its own project for the um, Moodle.org plugins database. And when a user submits a plugin, it creates a tracker in the, in the database for us to review. Plugin reviewers are free to pick any plugin from that queue in any order they wish. Some plugins are much quicker to review than others, 
and some can require much more specialised knowledge to review. We encourage the review team to alternate a first in, first out, and a last in, first out process, so that some plugin developers get quick feedback, um, especially those new to the Moodle community. Key thing to be aware of is the review team are volunteers. So it's also really important that they enjoy that review process and review plugins they find interesting. Um, if they're not enjoying that process, then no plugins will get reviewed. And sometimes that does mean some plugins take quite a bit of time to sort of progress through the, 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 process, the, the system. Um, I don't think I mentioned here, I've kind of skipped my notes here a wee bit, um, but members of the Plugins Guardian team have access to a filtered version of this report, which includes access to view the description and the screenshots the developers added to the entry. But that's not a requirement to engage within the, uh, the review process at all. It's just It just helps uh, some of the, the team that are doing it a lot more regularly. Um, this is the developer zone tab that developers see on, on the plugin entry, and this helps them find the contrib issue. So on that developer zone tab, they can click on the link to the contrib issue in the tracker. What it also does when that plugin submitted is it adds a comment in the moodle.org plugins um, entry down the very bottom, and it's the first comment that appears on that plugin. So if you get a, an existing plugin in the database and want to see who reviewed that, what were the notes on that, you can go through and find that first original comment on that plugin's entry, click on the link to the contrib issue and find where that review took place, who did the review, what the notes were and stuff like that. So that's quite a, a useful thing to be aware of. Um, once the developers found the plugin they want to review, they post a comment on that tracker issue to mention that's going to take a look. They can also assign that contrib issue to themselves, but that's not a requirement. If a reviewer has a free moment, they may perform a quick review on a plugin, provide some initial early feedback before they do a complete review on the plugin. Um, I do that quite often when I'm waiting for a, um, a long build process. If I'm waiting for unit tests to pass or BHAT tests to pass or a, a CI pipeline, if I've got five minutes, I'll pull up the queue and dig around and, and, and give some initial feedback. But I won't assign myself that tracker because I'm not actually doing the full review. I'm just trying to give some initial feedback to the, um, to the users. There's also a canned response for plugin reviews in the Moodle tracker. So when you um, go to add a comment, you can click on the canned response option and it gives you a template that allows a reviewer to run through the different items and give feedback on, on how that plugin complies with our checklist, which I'm going to cover now, the checklist. Uh, there's a link on this slide to the checklist, but you can also find it on the Moodle Dev Docs. If you go to moodledev.io, search for plugin contribution checklist. Um, it's, it's quite detailed. Um, we also ask the plugin developers to review that list to help identify any issues before the review team takes a look. But um, uh, the review performed is a basic check. It should not be considered a full security review or a certification. The review team doesn't always look at every single line of a plugin's code base and we don't certify that the plugin is safe. The community should perform their own risk assessment prior to installing the plugin and decide if it's safe for them to use. That's quite important because also we only review it the first time it lands, right? So six months down the track, 12 months down the track, two years down the track, the developer may have changed um, or may have missed some things and, and start doing some things that, that possibly aren't safe for your, for your organizations. The review doesn't require full compliance with Moodle's coding guidelines. We don't need everything to be fully compliant, but there are some key things that we do require from all plugins. I'm gonna run through uh, a few things that the checklist covers. Um, I'm not gonna cover everything that's in that checklist, but these are the three areas I want to, to cover just in this session today. Usability, uh, again, you know, it does, this is kind of going back to that testing stuff that I was talking before. Does the plugin work in a recent Moodle release? It's good to make sure that while testing, you have that developer debugging set with display errors on as well, because many developers aren't aware of those settings and may not have tested their plugins with those settings turned on. I tend to tend to test plugins using the, the latest Moodle development branch with a recent version of PHP and on a Postgres database, because quite often this will identify plugins that will have a hard-coded MySQL specific query or code that triggers PHP deprecation warnings. 
Plugins have to support both MySQL and Postgres-based databases to be approved within the plugins database and shouldn't output debugging errors when debugging is turned on. We don't require Oracle or Microsoft SQL to be supported, but we do require both of those two databases to be supported. Metadata. This is kind of the stuff around the plugin. This is kind of the plugin's database description, um, screenshots. Uh, they must clearly state what the plugin does. Uh, it can't be a one-line sentence with this is a cool plugin. It needs to tell us what it does so that people that are looking at the plugin entry can understand what it is. They have to have their source control and bug tracker list links listed. Um, the developer must have the rights to use the name or the images within the plugin entry. That's kind of a bit of a weird one. Um, there are some organizations out there that restrict the use of their trademarks. Even if you're integrating with a commercial tool, you may not actually have the rights to use the trademarks associated with that tool. And so that includes things like logos, sometimes the name. We've had this issue sometimes with video um, platforms in the past where the video um, organization uh, has heavily trademarked the name of their tool and don't want you to use that anywhere in, in a in a case like a Moodle plugin, unless it's their own plugin. They want to retain that for their own use, create their own Moodle plugin that they can brand. Um, if a subscription's required to use the plugin, good examples like plagiarism plugins uh, that require you to pay money to use that tool, uh, or a commercial artificial intelligence tool, that has to be clearly stated within the plugin description. So you have to say this plugin requires a subscription to use. You can't use it for free. Uh, you can download the plugin for free because it's open source, but you can't actually use it without that subscription. We also make a check in that process to make sure that the plugin developer is following the Moodle trademark. And if we're unsure, we request from the support from the Moodle trademark team to confirm prior to approval of the plugin. So that includes in their plugins DB entry, it includes in the website that they link to in the readme, it includes all of that sort of stuff. They have to follow the Moodle trademark, otherwise we can't approve the plugin. The code, okay, here's, some of you are probably waiting for the slide and the, the content here. What do we look at when we're getting it to the code? Um, it's hard to look at the full code base for some plugins. Uh, some plugins can take me hours and hours, like sort of 16 hours to review the code aspects because they've put so much effort into it. Um, so we can't do everything, but, we're, but I'm going to run through some of the key things we looked through. Um, I've kind of listed them there, but I'm going to cover, cover them a wee bit later. Um, if the plugin's hosted on GitHub, this is one of my tips, uh, I will often drop an issue in their GitHub tracker suggesting they might consider adding support for GitHub Actions. That helps identify how their code complies with Moodle standards and also runs automated tests that they've implemented in their code base. When a plugin complies really well with the standards, it's actually much easier for the review team to review. We don't require compliance with all of those guidelines, but it does make our job easier when we're reading code that looks like Moodle, feels like Moodle, and we can identify that it's using the right APIs and, and, and structures. I also use the canned response feature in GitHub. So I have a bunch of pre-selected text that I drop in as issues, which helps me quickly create common issues that I find during the review. I have like 20 of them. I, I, it's, it's a really fast thing for me. I don't have to type it all out. I just copy it, paste it in. And so sometimes within one minute, I've created 10 issues in their tracker that are all giving enough context for them to, to do it with. Another good tip, check the pre-check report. Moodle runs the coding guide line checks as well in the plugins database. And so on the developer zone tab, you get to see this uh, code pre-checks, in fact, on the, on the home page of the page itself, where that download button is, right underneath it, you'll see that code pre-checks link. And if you click on that, it opens up the bigger sort of panel of that that I'm showing down the bottom there. Key things that I look at for this when I'm, when I'm doing an initial plugin is making sure that the PHP lint passes. Because if the lint is failing, it potentially shows a significant PHP error. Other things in that list that are quite good to look at, uh, save point checks. Uh, those two things, the lint and the save point checks, 
potentially might block approval depending on what's coming back in that report. Um, quite often we see lint checks failing when a plugin includes a third party library and that library doesn't support a particular PHP version or it has some test infrastructure in it that is supposed to be designed for an old PHP version. So that wouldn't block approval. Um, if the code that the, is in use is failing lint, that would potentially block approval. Frankenstyle. Uh, so this is kind of a weird word, and I'm sure many of you here will know it, and some of you won't. Um, it's the naming convention we use to uniquely identify Moodle plugins. It includes the plugin type and the plugin name, and it has to be used in quite a few places within the plugin's code. Some of those places are clear blockers for the plugin's DB approval process. An example here, mod underscore attendance is the Frankenstyle name of the activity plugin attendance. Tool underscore MFA is the Frankenstyle name of the admin tool plugin for multi-factor authentication. And so that's all one word, it's all lowercase, it's usually got one underscore in it, sometimes it might have a couple, but usually it's the, the plugin type at the start, mod for plugin, or tool for admin tool, or block for blocks, and then an underscore, and then the name of that plugin, uh, the code name of that plugin. So the key areas we look at that use that Frankenstyle convention uh, are here. The table names are probably one of the most important ones. Uh, in fact, these are all pretty important. But the table names for your plugin are, are defined inside the install.xml file. All of the tables in the plugin have to be prefixed with that Frankenstein name. That's really important when a site decides they no longer want that plugin and decide to uninstall it. Moodle's uninstall processes will automatically delete any tables that match the Frankenstein prefix. If a developer wrote their own plugin that does some attendance stuff and then named a, a table inside that plugin underscore a, uh, attendance tracking or under, attendance underscore tracking, when the site went, hey, we don't need this attendance plugin anymore, we'll, we'll delete that. It would also delete that other table that the developer had written inside their other custom plugin. So you need to make sure that you, you those, those names are, are right in the install file or it can cause pretty significant problems. Classes uh, should be namespaced using the plugin's Frankenstein name. But we don't block approval if plugins are using the Frankenstein prefix on, on class names instead of putting them in namespaced classes. So some of you are old Moodle developers will remember some of the old guidelines around um, class names. We used to be able to use the Frankenstein prefix on the class name. You can still do that for plugins. We won't block approval on that. Functions outside classes must also be named with the Frankenstein prefix. So that's lib.php files, local lib.php files, also any other helper files where the functions that are created aren't inside a class. They aren't wrapped inside a class. They're just inline functions. They have to use the Frankenstein prefix. We block approval if they don't, because if you write a plugin that says um, clear string, function clear string, and there's a function called clear string in Moodle core, they will clash and, and all sorts of bad stuff can happen. Um, constants are another good one. They have to be using the prefix as well. Plugin configuration also has to be stored within the config plugins table and should use the right Frankenstein name. That also means that when a, a plugin's uninstalled, those config settings also get deleted. If those config settings are being stored in the global config table or the CFG, you would have seen that in code, the dollar sign CFG, then those settings will, will stay within the site forever and they're in the wrong place. So they need to be in that config plugins table. Um, I can talk more about how that, that works if, if people have questions later. Of course, we do a whole lot on security. Um, there are some really, really good uh, guidelines in the Moodle developer documentation site 
I've got a link down the bottom there to that. So if any of you haven't seen that, please go and have a look. I refer to that summary of the guidelines a lot. There's a section inside that page that says, here's a summary of the guidelines. Really nice, easy way to read. Um, quite a lot of the developers that submit plugins haven't had a look at security before, so it's quite a, a, a good wee thing. Um, key things in that are to make sure that login and capability checks are made in the right places, particularly in AJAX style pages. Uh, quite often developers will remember to put those inside the main view file, but all of those AJAX scripts they create, they forget about those, and so we, we, we check those to make sure. Also, the SQL queries. Uh, they have to use placeholders instead of putting the variables within the inline SQL statement. I use that as a good way to, to check if the developers accidentally hard-coded the MDL default table name prefix as well. Um, those SQL queries, if they're pure SQL, the table names have to be around curly braces. And sometimes the developers just put the, the text MDL underscore instead of putting the curly braces around those. Typically, any direct access to those get, post, or request globals is not allowed. So if we find them in the code, usually that's a clear, no, nah, it's a rejection, you need to fix it. The developer must be using the, the required and optional param APIs that are built inside Moodle for accessing that data. The param raw option is used inside those required or optional param APIs. And it's accidentally used by developers sometimes. Um, that raw option doesn't perform any form of data sanitization. So we tend to just check where that's used and see if it's more appropriate for them to use an int or a text style cleaning on that uh, function, on that, on that input. If the code contains any custom action code that doesn't use Moodle Forms, that's when you, you click a link and delete something, or you click a link and it does an update or an insert, or you, you have an interface that, um, that triggers an action. We check to make sure that the Moodle CSRF token, it's called the CES key, is being used correctly in those places to prevent CSRF attacks. Um, I can talk on security a whole lot more, um, but I don't want to use up all, all our time. This is uh, one of the most common mistakes I'm seeing at the moment in plugins that are submitted to the database. Um, often by experienced developers that don't understand Moodle's APIs. When a plugin implements a web service, the web service execute function has to perform a validate context and a require capability check like shown in that bottom image there. So that bottom image should sit somewhere in the execute function of their web service. Often a developer will incorrectly assume that the capability they define in the functions variable in the services.php file will get checked by Moodle. So that top image there where it says functions, it has an array in there and inside that array a capabilities item and a list of capabilities that are required for users to call the web service, local group manager create groups. But that's only used as an advisory when the user interface is, when you're in, in Moodle, when you're creating or configuring a web service, saying, I want to, to create a web service attached to this user, this user is allowed to call it. That interface says, hey, this user has to have these capabilities. That's the only real place that capability is used in the, in the functions array. So you have to check those capabilities themselves in your web service function itself. I've seen this a lot. Um, and it's a really easy thing to fix and easy thing to, to, to miss. Um, CSS, Moodle takes the styles.css file from all of the plugins in the site and bundles them into one file to help browser caching. That means that the rules inside that CSS can apply to any area of the Moodle site. So you put something in that styles.css file, because Moodle bundles it all into one, that rule actually gets applied to everywhere in the site, not just your plugin. So Moodle helpfully auto-creates a, a large number of different tags within the page, depending on its path, which can help when defining that rule for the CSS. In the example given here, we see path mod my module added to the beginning of the rule, which would apply to a plugin within the path mod slash my module. So you'd get that automatically. So in the CSS rule, you need to have those in the right place. If they just put content area in that CSS and made it bold, 
all the content areas in the whole Moodle site would be bold, which we don't want. Um, the copyrights, we talked a little bit about this before. Copyright must be the real person who originally authored the file, or in some cases, the organization the developer works for. Sometimes developers will accidentally copy the header from other Moodle files and bring out someone else's name over. I've done that before. Um, if the file was created by an artificial intelligent assistant, the copyright should be allocated to the individual who instructed the AI assistant or the individual's employer. We don't want to see copyright chat GPT. Chat GPT doesn't own that copyright. The person who instructed the AI tool does. Developers will often copy code from other locations. However, not all code is able to be included within Moodle's GPL code base. The GPL uh, license has some restrictions on it. A good example of that is Stack Overflow. Code snippets that you copy directly from the Stack Overflow site are in a bit of a gray zone, particularly depending on the date that they were authored on. So if those comments in Stack Overflow were authored on a particular date, you might not be allowed to use them because the licensing around that particular comment is, is not clear. So it's usually only best to use that code for inspiration on how to address something rather than just copying snippets directly into your code. Third party libraries with their own license and copyright, such as those included with Composer or external PHP or JavaScript libraries can be included within a plugin. There are lots of those in Moodle. Uh, they can only be included if they're compatible with the GPL. If there are restrictions like must not be used for commercial use, or you can use this plugin, but not if you're a military institution, those sorts of things break the GPL. And so you can't have them inside your code because you're breaking the GPL license. So what we do to help avoid some of that is we ask developers to put a third party libs.xml file within their plugin that describes all of those libraries and the license they use. The other advantage with that particular plugin is it excludes anything listed in that file from the coding checks. So when you upload the file to Moodle, it looks at those. Those aren't Moodle files, so it won't run them through those coding guideline checks. Then we get to sort of towards the end, I think. Uh, during the review, uh, all of the, the issues we find, we either post on the issues tracker that the, you, the, the developers made available, but we also post a summary of that into the contrib issue. Some of our review team members use the canned response that I mentioned before, but it's optional. Um, others may report all issues to the GitHub issues tracker and summarize those issues in a comment on the contrib issue. Um, and then the plugins database curators, which are David, Mudrak, and myself, review the comments from the reviewer and will either make the decision to approve that plugin based on the review or flag it as requiring more work. That notifies the developer of the status update and removes it from our active review queue. We do our best to strike a balance between issues that would cause widespread difficulty or security and minor issues that would be good to fix, but shouldn't block the plugin's database approval. We don't really want um, to to hold plugins back because they don't have this gold standard of code. But we want to protect the reputation of the, the plugins database and, and provide a service to the Moodle community to, to make some form of process uh, to allow for, 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 for good, well-maintained plugins. Hopefully, um, I've, I've run through a whole lot of stuff there. Hopefully, I didn't speak too fast and my Kiwi accent wasn't too difficult for, for some of the international people here. Um, the slides will be available later and uh, along with the recording and inside the slides are my speaker notes as well. So hopefully, uh, you can ignore some of the typos and spelling mistakes of that. But um, uh, if, if you didn't quite catch what I said, it'll be there. We'd love for you to help. That's kind of what we're hoping from this presentation. Um, and we, we really want more people to help uh, support that plugins database review process by testing, uh, grabbing something on the list, installing it, and then chucking some feedback on the contrib issue, or by coming uh, or, or doing a basic code check, 
uh, which you don't need to be a, a full plugin guardian to do. You could just post a comment on there. I often ask some of my um, uh, Catalyst team members, I do a bunch of training for, for our developers, and one of the training tasks I ask them to do is to review a plugin, and they'll just go and find something from the queue, drop a comment on the tracker, and then I'll, I'll guide them through that process. Um, or you could become an official plugin guardian. If you're, you know, if you're interested in that, Reach out to me or David um, or Rajneel after this, and we'd be happy to talk further about how you can help. Um, and that is pretty much me. Here's some contact information. I'm going to turn screen sharing off, so that will disappear for a second while Rajneel takes it back. But uh, we can post more stuff in the chat uh, later if I can find. Rajneel might need to take it off me. Yeah. Thanks, Dan. Uh, so let's see. We've got a few questions in the chat. Let me just find them. Okay, so we've got a question from Ryan. Uh, it seems that you have you would have a lot of code uh, data. Uh, have you tried using AI plugins for quick code review for Moodle plugins? We have. Uh, we've we've played with a few, um, particularly our Australian and, and Canada office are doing a lot of playing with something called um, uh, uh, Tabby at the moment. So we're playing a lot with Tabby at the moment to see what it's like. Um, I'm not yet convinced that it's going to help with code reviews but it does seem to be useful for some other stuff when we're writing code, particularly for people that understand the code already. Um, it's not all that great at the moment for, for people that don't understand the code because it can occasionally give some strange results. But if you're able to understand it, running it has been useful. Yeah, it's called um, Tabby. Uh, and you can train it on Moodle and you can run it on your own systems. Uh, it doesn't need to be using Copilot. Um, you, you can basically train it on that stuff. So yeah, um, check it out. Uh, we'll probably write some blog posts about it at some point when we've, we've had a really good play with it. Mm -hmm. And there's this other question from uh, Uriel. Is the, is the CSS rule applied to the Teams plugin as well? So there's requirements for the CSS rules. Is the CSS rules applied to what plugin? The theme plugins as well. The requirement to have this prefix, the Frankenstein prefix to the theme. theme. Yes, 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 it is. So um, it's a yes, yes, and no. Um, uh, it depends if it's if it's it's mixed. But it's a good question. Yes, it's not really completely required for theme plugins because you want the theme plugin to change everything on the site. Uh, so yeah, yeah, good point. I will probably update my slide to make sure that I, I clarify that if I do this presentation again. Uh, and there's this question from Stephen. Uh, how are the badges into the, uh, how are the badges into the plugins to be uh, assigned? Are they manually added by the reviewer? Yeah, so there's, there's a range of things that happen there. Some of those are automatic and most of them are not. Um, so things like the privacy API, that's an automatic one. We detect that the privacy API is there, so we drop it in. Um, the early bird awards are based on a, um, uh, a time frame. So we announce in the forums, we're going to give you a few days to, to a few weeks after the release, and then we go through and do that manually. Um, there's also a reviewer's choice award that gets a, that's awarded when the reviewer goes through and goes, hey, I love this plugin, it's awesome, I uh, I'm attaching that. Um, I can't remember of any others that aren't manual um, off the top of my head. Uh, and there's this question from uh, Volodima. Uh, I hope I've got the name correctly. Uh, what about the plugin architecture? Are you checking uh, code logic and provide uh, provide advices to you know use persistent classes or not to use them, or, and maybe recommendations for performance and caching? So the question yeah, is: definitely. Are you providing yeah architectural recommendations? I I do. So when I'm reviewing a plugin, if I spot things that are really weird performance-wise, I'll drop that into the into the structure. I'll say things like, um, and, and like the, like I mentioned before, the the Franken-style prefix is is required um, 
for class names that are outside namespace classes. Quite often we'll encourage developers to put them into namespace classes. We'll, we'll give some encouragement there about trying to follow some good architecture. Um, but there, there are some developers who who aren't interested in some of that feedback. Um, but yes, we do We do provide a range of, of feedback. Um, and, and I try my best to, to do what I can to, to give good quality peer reviews so that they're able to action from, from that and, and make some good improvements. Uh, the tabby thing I mentioned before is called tabby ML. So that's, um, uh, if you search tabby ML, you'll find it. Otherwise, I'll just post it here. Um, we're still playing with that, so don't um, don't take my recommendation as something that, hey, this is great. We're just sort of playing with it. We've integrated it with our, um, uh, uh, some of our staff and the other offices have integrated it with their IDEs. I think I saw a question there somewhere about um, my GitHub um, action um, uh, saved queries. I'll see if I can find that now while Rajneel has a look for more questions. Are there any other questions that you spotted? Yeah, no, I think that's all all the questions that we have. <clears throat> uh, yeah, just having one last check. No, yeah. So yeah, so that that's all the questions. So uh thank you, Dan, and uh, thank you everyone for the questions. Yeah, thank you for coming. Um, hopefully, some of you found that useful. Um, I'm, I should find my um, my link here shortly. I put them in a GitHub repository. Um, some of the the contents a little bit out of date, but you'll be able to see the the basics. Uh, so yeah, if you have enjoyed the session, we'd love you to consider getting involved further and help us. Uh, grow by contributing to the development of Moodle Academy. Uh, you could do this by visiting our Get Involved course, which you'll find in the front page of the Moodle Academy site. Uh, you could suggest ideas for uh, courses or, or webinars, and you can vote for you know some ideas that have been already suggested. Uh, we're always on the lookout for community uh, members to present webinars such as this one, uh, or help us co-create our short online courses on Moodle Academy. Uh, and we'd also love you uh, we'd also love your help in making Moodle Academy more inclusive. So if you are if you are able to, please jump into the Moodle uh, Translate Moodle Academy course and uh, help get started. Uh, help us translate the Moodle Academy uh, courses and webinars into other languages. And please help spread the word about Moodle Academy. Uh, you could tell your colleagues uh, about the courses we offer and the events that we run. Uh, and when uh, you complete a course. Uh, you earn a badge. If you're an edu educator, you might think about you know getting the Moodle Educator Certificate. Uh, you could take the Are You Ready for the MEC quiz, and one of our certified uh, service providers will support you through the entire certification process. Uh, and thank you, uh, everyone, for joining today. I hope you found the session useful, and we hope to see you in another Moodle Academy webinar.